All right, well, it is 11.30, so I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, we've got lots of people continuing to join in, but um, welcome and, and good morning. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It's great to connect with many of you virtually. Um, I'm Ann Marbarger. I'm the Executive Director of Padres Pedal the Cause. I um, mean, if you're new to our organization, our mission is to accelerate cures for cancer by funding collaboration among San Diego's top cancer research and care centers. I um, mean, so this is the second of our Road to Discovery series webinars. Um, a few weeks ago, we heard from Rady Children's Hospital about a recently funded project on personalized approaches to pediatric medulla blastoma that was really interesting. Uh, and this week, we're going to pivot and talk about lung cancer. Um, so in a few minutes, we will hear directly from Dr. Ruben Shaw, Dr. Hafen Hussein, and Dr. Nick Kosserb in their project that was recently funded by Padres Pedal. And I'm going to read the title here, um, Examination of Inhibitors of ULK1 Autophagy Kinase as Therapeutics in Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer. So um, don't worry, uh, the, the grant recipients are going to explain exactly what that means. I'm not going to attempt to do so. Um, and we also have a very special guest today that, who I will introduce in a few minutes. Um, I just want to touch on really what the purpose and the goal is of today's session. Um, and it's really to provide a forum for our Padres Pedal participants and donators, uh, donors and sponsors um, to hear directly from the researchers that they're funding. Um, without you all, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. And we really appreciate your support over the years. And today's a great opportunity um, also to understand more about collaboration. So collaboration is a word that's woven throughout the Padres Pedal um, dialogue. Um, and today we have an opportunity um, to hear not only from basic scientists like Nick and Ruben, um, but also from a clinical researcher, Dr. Hussein, um, and a, a patient testimonial from an amazing uh, woman, Isabella, who we'll hear from in just a minute. So um, thank you again for joining. Um, we'll just touch on a couple housekeeping items um, before we begin. Uh, if you intend to have your lunch with us today, no problem. You are muted and we can't see you. Um, so. Uh, we will do about 45 minutes or so of dialogue and active questions with our panelists, and then we will save time for Q&A at the end of the conversation. Um, since you're muted, the best way to submit questions is using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You can just type those in. I encourage you to do that as soon as you think of the questions, just that gives us a little bit more time to weave them into the dialogue. Um, and the session is being recorded. So uh, we will share this broadly afterwards if, if you're curious about sharing it with others. Um, and then our staff, we have a few staff members monitoring the chat feature. Um, in case you have any technical details, we will do our best to help you. You can see here in the diagram, the chat feature or chat room is where you can submit any um, overall feedback or issues that you're having. And then Q and A, you can just go ahead and, and submit your questions there. Um, so with that, uh, to set the stage for today, we're going to talk about lung cancer. And um, the unfortunate reality about lung cancer is that it's the number one cause of cancer deaths per year, causing more deaths annually than colon, breast, and prostate cancer combined. And so to start our conversation, we have an amazing guest, Isabella de la Puse, um, who we had the good fortune of meeting just a few months ago when she was out here in San Diego um, with her bike. And she um, underwent a huge accomplishment and rode her bike from the Pacific Ocean here uh, in San Diego to the Atlantic. Um, she's an amazing person. Um, and she was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer in January 2018 and has hardly um, let that slow her down. So um, Isabella is here to join us. And she's going to tell us a little bit about her journey um, with cancer. And here's Dr. Uh, Hussein, great to see you as well. Thanks for joining just in the, in the nick of time. Hi, thank you. Also, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> no problem. Thanks for joining. So, Isabella, we're going to give you the floor, and we are curious. Um, first of all, thanks for joining, uh, and we'd love to hear, you know, a little bit about what it was like to be this healthy global adventure mother of five um, who gets diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Thank you so much for having me and for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> um, so I was, I was like the picture of health before my diagnosis. I had a physical a couple of months before and they said, you know, all good. We wish everyone could be this healthy. <laughs> and I never had any trouble breathing or um, was compromised in a way that one might say, oh, you might have lung cancer. You know, I was an athlete. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. 
and uh, was very active. And I started having pain in my back. That's how it manifested. And over the course of a few months, it got increasingly painful. And, and finally, I was diagnosed with an MRI that they thought was going to say I had a sports injury. And it turned out um, I had stage four lung cancer. And uh, from that diagnosis, um, for the next few weeks, I went from sort of being active to not being able to move. The cancer was quickly eating through my spine. I had six brain tumors. You know, I was, <laughs> I was pretty much a mess by the time I started treatment. And it was, it was really devastating. It was surprising to everyone, devastating. I had, you know, five children at home. Um, just nobody expected it. So I guess the first step in all that, even before getting and finding a treatment was just getting my head around it and coming to terms, you know, sort of that sadness that you have when you have to say goodbye to the life that you knew and sort of embrace a new reality. Um, but I have to say that is a first step because you can't really move forward till you embrace that new reality and accept it um, and try to find some joy with it. <laughs> so uh, that took a few weeks, um, but that was, that was the first step and then on to treatment. Wow. So there are so many aspects about you that are exceptional. Uh, you're a parent of five, like you said, you're an unbelievable athlete and you're very humble. And I just have to share that we had a um, a prep call last week for our webinar and uh, Isabella was actually out running a marathon and um, she was nervous that she wasn't going to get back in time. So um, you haven't just taken this diagnosis and, and stopped living or slowed down. You've really had what must be a tremendous um, attitude of strength and, and courage. And so um, thanks again for, for sharing your story. Uh, your doctors, I think, originally gave you two months when you were diagnosed back in January. And of course, it's been about two years and, and eight or eight months or so. Um, can you talk, tell us about your treatment journey and, and the highs and lows and, and the different mechanisms that you've used to battle cancer? Absolutely. So when you're first diagnosed, all they know, I guess, is that you have non-small lung cancer, and then you have to go through the mutation testing, which is going to become relevant when the doctors here start to talk. Um, and I had a targetable mutation, which did put me in a category of people who um, they could try a targeted TKI drugs on. So that, uh, that was my first line treatment. And it really worked um, within 24 hours. I started feeling better. It was awesome. And I was very lucky to have that mutation, EGFR mutation. And so that began the turnaround and that uh, I, it took about three months to sort of stabilize, get the cancer under control. And then I could start building strength and, and moving back into my life. I actually did my first marathon after I, uh, I got sick about four months later using poles and uh, walking slowly. It took me like nine and a half hours, <laughs> but I was quite determined to to get back to things. Um, and also, you know, because lung cancer often manifests in the, in the bones um, and walking is so good for your bone strengthening, I sort of have continued to walk as much as possible just to keep my bones strong. So, so the TKI was my first osmertinib, my first line treatment. The problem with targeted drugs is that they do not work forever. The doctors are very clear up front, you know, enjoy this. It won't last forever. Usually in my case, they said um, average is 18 months. And sure enough, 18 months later, I had new growth progression, which indicated that the TKI was not working anymore. And that was treated with radiation. And that was also in the bone, more bone cancer. And then I am now on um, two uh, TKIs um, in the hopes that the the way the cancer is mutated around the first, that the second drug will attack that mutation. And the jury's still out on that. I get scanned in two weeks. I am very hopeful that the cancer is being controlled and I feel really good. So that's, that's my story. <laughs> wow. So how are you feeling now? I know that you said when you finished your bike ride across the country, you were feeling fit for, for that um, activity, but then you started undergoing some pain. Are you naturally feeling pretty good now or? When the cancer progresses, it progresses quickly. And once it was clear, I did the radiation, but that controlled one spot of cancer. And then 
it started growing more and you feel it, particularly when you're an athlete. I mean, I feel it in my brain. I feel it in my body. So it was clear to me when I finished that bike ride, I was very lucky to finish it and then, you know, went right into new scans and, and new treatment. And uh, right now, the only thing I'm dealing with are the side effects of the treatments, which are minimal compared to a more traditional platinum-based chemotherapy. Targeted drugs are, are definitely easier to take. It's a pill, they're pills, um, but they do have side effects. So I definitely feel that, but I feel in my body that the cancer is under control, so. Wow, and, and you're not the first person that I've heard. I know we have another um, good friend of Padres Petal who has metastatic breast cancer, and she says the same thing. She can feel it in her back and in her spine and in her body when it's back and it's time to go back and um, get on a different treatment plan. So um, probably like many of our attendees today, I have a million questions that I could ask you about your sports and, and your body and your treatment. Um, so we're going to come back. I think for now we're going to pivot and we're going to talk about the three panelists that we um, have here with us today who have the new project, a new approach for studying lung cancer. Um, I also just want to say that, um, you know, we've had the opportunity to hear um, from Ruben before at Padres Pedal the Cause and Nick uh, up on stage. I remember um, doing a Q&A and, and Dr. Uh, Hussein um, Hotham, we've heard you speak. Um, at a lunch and learn, but we've never really had this opportunity to have all three of you together in the same room. So um, we're really excited about this. And I think many of the things that Isabella mentioned about her journey and the mutations and targeted therapies um, will all weave nicely into what we're going to learn about from our panelists. So um, with that, we have uh, Ruben Shaws, the director of the Salk Cancer Center. Um, Dr. Hotham, who's is a um, oncologist at Moore's Cancer Center who studies lung cancer and treats patients. And Dr. Nick Cosford is the Deputy Director of the Sanford Burnham Prebis um, Cancer Center. And so uh, collectively, you all represent three of our four beneficiary institutions. Um, Rady is not with us today. Um, but I would like to give the floor um, to each of you and ask that you share a little bit with our audience just about your education and your training, um, your current research focus, and how you ultimately decided to dedicate your career to cancer research. So Ruben, do you want to kick it off. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. And I thanks to uh, the wonderful people at Padres Pedal for this opportunity and uh, for being able to directly connect with people about this. Um, I just want to say, even knowing various people's stories and watching, you know, in real time cases like Isabella's, that is one of the most remarkable stories and your ability to actually even tell your story um, it's just incredibly inspiring and powerful. And uh, I, I can't think of actually a better opportunity as a, someone who's worked on cancer research their whole adult life to try to explain to someone like what we're trying to do, your life uh, or your just this short piece of your fight with cancer encapsulates uh, kind of the entire point of why I and, and the other, my colleagues here uh, on the call and, and so many of the people who work in our cancer centers uh, get up and go to work every day. This, this is the exact definition of why we're doing this, uh, is to make more cases, to give back more years like the, the two years that you've had, uh, and then to push that so that uh, this is no longer um, the the damaging um, sentence that it used to be and that this is uh, something that can be treated and then treated again when uh, when and if it, it comes back. So uh, I just want to say I'm even having known your story, hearing it from you in this way is just incredibly powerful and incredibly inspiring. So thank you uh, for being here with us today. Um, I'll quickly pivot to uh, my own background. I grew up on a farm in upstate New York. Um, and then went to college at Cornell, didn't know anything about how someone actually does cancer research, uh, but worked in a biochemistry lab that was working on early genes that were some of the first genes found that were altered in human cancer. And I learned that as an undergrad and in the classes, it, w it wasn't in the textbook yet. And I at first found that like really hard to believe that scientists like that year, when I was a freshman, were like discovering some of the main genes altered in human cancer. So for all of human history, 
the real basis, the actual thing that goes wrong in individual cells of our body that gives rise to lung cancer or brain cancer, we're actually just being discovered that calendar year in real time. And I just thought that was amazing uh, and lucky to even like live through something like that. And I was just so uh, intensely interested in working on uh, discovering the bases of these diseases, but especially of cancer. And so I went, uh, worked in an undergrad research lab on, on basic cancer research as an undergrad, went straight to grad school at MIT and had the good fortune to work in one of the uh, main labs there. And they have a NCI designated research, basic research cancer center. Uh, and so from an early, you know, I was 21, from an early age then was uh, involved in kind of helping do research to get at the basis of different types of cancer. And even then, the hope was that by decoding this list of all these different cancer genes, this one is altered in lung cancer at 10%, and this one is altered in breast cancer at 30%, that by understanding what the basis, how the cancers start in the first place, that we can, in the future, develop therapeutics to treat the specific thing that goes wrong in those cancers. And Isabella's story captures this, uh, encapsulates what the, what the dream was back in the uh, you know, late 80s and early 90s was to someday develop drugs like that. Um, and so then I went, stayed in cancer research. And, and by that time, unfortunately, even though I was only 30, I'd already had people very close to me um, pass away from cancer. Um, and uh, it, it'll never not, for many people have had that personal experience, but especially when it's a, a young person, uh, it just feels so um, hopeless and helpless and cruel, but it also helps reinvigorate the fight uh, for those of us who want to get to the heart of this thing. So to make a longer story short, I um, did again research at the basis of these genes in cancer in my postdoctoral work at Harvard Medical School, working on a gene that's actually frequently altered in lung cancer, which again, uh, you know, quite remarkably, this was in 1999, the gene itself had actually just been identified that year. So scientists only really got the full picture of all the genes in the human body and which genes were associated in which cancers in the late 90s, like early 2000s. So our ability to understand um, human cancers and what causes different ones and how to treat them in a better way is just, we're still, you know, at the most 20 years into a revolution uh, of this understanding. Um, and uh, at the end of, I had just discovered this unexpected link between uh, this lung cancer gene and metabolism and cellular processes that restore energy balance. And, and it's that work that I continued when I came to the Salk Institute. Just a, a few words about Salk and about these basic cancer institutes that the NCI re, uh, recognizes in the United States. MIT is one, the Salk is another. The Salk was even on my radar, even though I spent my entire life in the Northeast, because it had a handful of luminaries that had made these original discoveries between cancer genes and the cause of cancer. It also had a man named Tony Hunter who had famously discovered a new type of enzyme, a new type of uh, protein that was altered in, in most of these types of enzymes were not only altered in human cancers, it turned out they were the things that caused the cancers in the first place. And um, Dr. Hunter's discovery of this in the late 1970s at the Salk Institute um, led to uh, a revolution in our understanding and ways to go about treating cancer. And in fact, the very drug that Isabella took, osimertinib, is uh, one kind of an entire group of drugs called TKIs. The TK in TKI relates to what Dr. Hunter discovered that day back on the courtyard uh, at the Salk Institute is tyrosine kinase uh, inhibitors. He discovered tyrosine activity and tyrosine kinases as being this type of cancer gene. And in others soon chipped in, this was not only Dr. Hunter, uh, but he really provided this first insight that led to this entire uh, area of cancer research. And um, 
So uh, at the Salk, I continued my work in lung cancer, very focused on coming up with the best combinations to treat different subsets and had the privilege and the uh, uh, pressure and uh, honor of actually taking over from Dr. Hunter, who was the head of our cancer center for many years. Uh, and um, I took over from him as the director a handful of years ago. So lung cancer and being able to deliver better treatments for lung cancer is my personal uh, passion project, if you will. Now, this relates to the other young men on uh, this uh, call uh, in that another great thing about San Diego is that we have these three cancer centers that all have different specialties. And many people don't realize this. In the United States, there's actually only one other city that has three NCI designated like gold star cancer centers. And that city is Manhattan. So um, even Boston, the Bay Area, San Francisco, they do not have what San Diego has. And, and this research project that Petal has awarded is, encapsulates one unique thing about San Diego. All of us work together. We are very much like to collaborate. We do not guard our secrets or go for scientific glory that I personally discovered something. Uh, San Diego has a very, very collaborative scientific research environment. So um, I won't say anything more. I'll let uh, Dr. Cosford and Dr. Hussein introduce their institutions, but I'll just end by saying, Salk, our piece of the puzzle, and, and my own piece of this project's puzzle, is that we do basic research into what these cancer genes do and what the biology is, what the effects are, and we discover biological pathways and processes, biochemistry that goes wrong, just like Dr. Hunter with the tyrosine kinase. And what I discovered about 10 years ago was another type of enzyme that is um, hyperactivated and altered in cancers, not even that dissimilar from Dr. Hunter's, but in a different type of cancer and in a more profound way is involved in keeping cells alive. And so we wondered whether or not that normal function of this, of this kinase to keep cells alive might actually be keeping tumor cells alive. And not just in general, but specifically when you treat them with a good drug like uh, azimeritinib that actually will do something in the tumor cells in your body, when you face that challenge of actually a drug that really is going to selectively kill the tumor cells, the tumor cells, which is a good thing, start freaking out because they realize they are going to die and they are going to selectively die and they throw up defense mechanisms to try to basically stop their cells from responding to the signal. In this process that Dr. Cosford and I, and now with Dr. Hussain are working on, is one of those stress responses that tries the tumor cells use to try to stay alive in response to therapy. Uh, and that's this ULK and uh, this autophagy, autophagy, self-eating process that we work on. So I'll, I'll stop there. I've already said too much, but uh, uh, why don't uh, Dr. Cosford, who is a world exceptional medicinal chemist, uh, let him tell, pick up the story. Yeah, thank you so much, Ruben. And um, Dr. Crossford, in, in doing your uh, background and introduction as well, if you can weave in, like Ruben said, some of the things that distinguish Sanford Burnham Prebis and, and piece the second uh, part of the puzzle that, that Ruben started for us, um, that would be great. Sure, <clears throat> happy to. And again, thanks for this opportunity to talk. And um, I know Ruben and her team and I are just incredibly grateful for this support from uh, Padre's Pedal of Cause. Um, yeah, I, I work at Sanford Burnham Previs, and again, like the Salk Institute, we are a, a, a basic research NCI designated cancer center. Um, but a few years ago, so I joined uh, SBP back in 2005, and I was specifically hired to build up the drug discovery component at the Institute. So not only do we have uh, basic science, but we also have the ability to discover new medicines. And my background is, as you can probably tell from my accent, I grew up in London and then I gradually moved west. So I was uh, went to university, got my bachelor's and PhD in Bath, which is in the west of England. And then I came over to the States to postdoc uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And then I spent some time in Delaware on the East Coast. And then I finally landed further west in San Diego. And 
my first job here, um, I was in a biotech company, and then I was part of a uh, big uh, a pharmaceutical company. And during that time, I really learned how to design new medicines. And um, so as a chemist, um, I have a different role than Ruben and her team. So Ruben's expertise is taking uh, tumor cells, cancer cells, understanding all the intricacies of the biology within the tumor cell. Her team, on the other hand, of course, sees patients. And so he absolutely understands how to treat people like Isabella and others. My role is different. So when I was a kid, I was absolutely fascinated with Lego. I used to spend all, t all kinds of time uh, making Lego models and building construction things. And what I do really, I would say, is like it's uh, Lego on a molecular basis. So to, in order to design uh, these targeted therapies that uh, Isabella talks about, like osimertinib, and other, you've heard the term precision medicines. So it's in my mind, it's kind of like I can sort of think about things in three dimensions. And I design these uh, new medicines, these small molecules, which uh, specifically go to the site of action in the tumor, kill the tumor cell uh, without harming normal cells. So this is obviously a complex process and, you know, it requires input from uh, people like Ruben and, for, and her team. Um, and, and my team uh, spent all our time designing these, these medicines. Um, and so the important, one of the really important things, and again, Isabella touched on this. So these precision medicines need to be able to kill tumor cells, but with that, again, but be safe uh, and not harm the body. And so, again, this is just a, a very complex uh, thing, which takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. And, um, uh, and the other issue related to this is that even with these uh, modern precision medicines, uh, resistance uh, happens, as Isabel mentioned. So osimertinib, which is uh, a very new medicine, was uh, worked well for about 18 months, but then uh, resistance kicked in. And so this is why it's so important for us to continue the search uh, for new medicines which are able to treat, treat patients uh, who have resistance. And that's exactly... Um, what we're doing. So as Ruben mentioned, we're targeting this cell survival process called autophagy. Uh, and what we found is that in these cancer cells, in particular in, uh, uh, lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer cells, this uh, cell survival process is it's taken over by these aggressive uh, tumor cells, these aggressive cancer cells, and it's used uh, to keep them surviving. But what our uh, new medicines do is they prevent the tumors from uh, multiplying and growing and ultimately kill them. So uh, that's, the, that's the approach we're taking. And um, I think I'm going to stop talking and hand over to the team at this point. <laughs> Nick, that was uh, very interesting. Thank you so much. And I, we're going to go home and get more Legos at our house tonight. So um, kids learn to be like you. But... Um, <laughs> One thing, a question just to put in the parking lot, I think we can probably come back to it a little bit later, but you're talking about um, personalized medicines and Isabella mentioned that she had metastatic disease and tumors in different sites on her body. So my question is around, can you, do you have to use different personalized medicines to target tumors in different parts of the body or can one drug hit all of them? Um, uh, yeah, that's a great question and I'll, um... I'll say my piece and then I'll let Ruben and her team jump in. But um, Isabella mentioned that she has a, a targetable mutation. And so these are the types of, this is what we are, one of the things we're aiming for. So um, within non-small cell lung cancer, uh, which is a, you know, a large population of lung cancer patients, there are multiple different mutations and um, one of the things we're targeting specifically is, is uh, problems with uh, what's called the KRAS signaling. And so that's just one example uh, of this process. And what's happened is, so back um, 30 years ago, really to treat lung cancer, 
you had, uh, you know, a lot of people know about platinum drugs, for example, and there's other, other old, older drugs that were developed even back in the 1960s, 70s, 80s. Um, but over the last few years, we've really started to become, again, much more precise in terms of what we're targeting to the point where um, real, true personalized medicine, where you're actually targeting not only a small population of patients, but ultimately uh, individuals. Th this is a real thing that we're going to see increasingly over the next several years. So again, I'll hand over to Ruben and her okay. team to pick up from there. Great. Um, Hatim, can you tell us about your background and uh, your clinical and, and um, research focus areas and, and what sets um, Morris Cancer Center apart uh, in terms of this puzzle that we're piecing together from the basic science institu institutions? You know, thank you so much, actually, and it's truly an honor to be here. And, um, you know, Isabella, it's truly amazing to hear your story. Um, you know, I think that some of the things actually that are true here is, is that you've had experiences that very few people will have, and you've had to make decisions and, um, and considerations in ways that very few people have to do, um, and families actually have to do as well. I think that, um, you know, treating as you have cancer as a journey, and also really kind of understanding how, um, you know, this in some ways is a marathon in its own right. And, um, you know, there is an element of chess as well that, you know, people have to play. And I think understanding that element of intricacy as it pertains to, um, you know, um, factors such as genes and resistance and strategic planning and um, sequencing and uh, combinations, you know, these are concepts actually that truly require, um, you know, kind of a, a team and a, a, a game plan. And I think kind of, you know, um, you know, hearing you speak, actually, you know, you've really lived that. Um, so I think that um, as a nutshell, I, I'm a medical oncologist and I've been um, practicing at Morris Cancer Center for, uh, for about eight years. Prior to that, I was at Johns Hopkins Hospital and, um, and one of the interests that I had over there was better understanding some of the genomic bases of cancer, largely because some of the genes actually and uh, the categorization of cancer as having a genomic basis in many capacities, uh, you know, kind of stemmed from some work that had been done there. And um, I, I particularly was interested in lung cancer uh, at a young age, largely because um, it has consistently been the most prevalent cancer in the U.S., and it is uh, the leading cause of death of cancer. And so I felt that being able to, um, uh, you know, play a role in terms of trying to um, address that point specifically was particularly meaningful to me um, in my training. I spent a lot of time doing both lung cancer as well as brain tumors. And both of those two tumor sets were ones actually which were linked in a way which I you know, found out largely because of uh, you know, the fact that lung cancer can also have unique uh, distributions and manifestations and how it, and how it acts. Um, uh, since the time of my training, a large area of where I've been interested in is how to better understand that genomic basis of cancer as it relates to drug development. And, um, you know, the cancer that you've been battling with EGFR specifically as a mutation uh, that is driving this tumor has truly been a model system that has provided the whole field an opportunity to understand how targeting genes can be done correctly to some degree. And I think that um, the medicine that you're on has truly, um, you know, shown efficacy in terms of improving overall survival uh, of being fairly well tolerated in many patients and also, um, you know, improving uh, responses in the brain. And I think that um, you've correctly mentioned that one of the unmet needs in areas that we really need to do better on is how to uh, develop strategy post-OC-Mertinib 
And I think that uh, this is a very active area of discovery, um, better understanding the genes that are involved, the interplay of how those genes function, and how we can monitor and predict and also uh, mitigate any uh, directional movements and shifts and how those genes change through time is, is important. And that's actually a large area of what I work on also from a clinical research standpoint is um, how do we track cancer through time to better understand how those genes are morphing and changing. And there have been some novel technologies that are deployed and now actually even FDA approved looking at how genes can be detected through blood sampling and how through time we can understand how cancer is changing to anticipate or direct the right combinations of new medicines to be added or switched to. I think another area that I focus on is um, better understanding how we can come up with the right type of uh, clinical trials that can provide access. And also want to commend you, Isabella, in some degree for, um, you know, really um, embracing new opportunities, you know, um, uh, you know, some of the ways that we're able to really advance the field is by, um, you know, truly embracing some new concepts. And I think that the concept that uh, Ruben and Nick and, um, you know, and I are kind of conception, you know, thinking about in this way is, is the first application of this strategy in EGFR mutant lung cancer. And I think that's actually very important because when we think about new ways to address EGFR mutation resistance, sometimes we focus primarily on genomics to kind of de you know, define that, but really understanding how the functions of the cells in common denominators and those functions across many oncogenes as well as survival pathways within cells can be um, you know, addressed, I think that enables a new way to build upon um, multiple genes that can come up and multiple resistant patterns that feed into a common denominator. And by affecting that common denominator pathway, one can you know, really improve, hopefully, outcomes for a broader category of patients rather than only with a certain type of resistance or, or such. Great, um, thank you, Hotham. So I wanna, um, our, our time is, is disappearing quickly. So I wanna make sure that we get um, to the, the part about talking about the project that you all um, just got funded by Padres Pedal. And if I just piece together the recipe or the puzzle piece that we're talking about here for the group, it's Ruben and the Salk really look at the cell biology and Nick and Sanford Burnham look at building medicines and chemicals and and often you treat patients like Isabella and the, the patient testimonial and really how does Padres Petal tie into this and it's the funding that we're providing um, and bringing you all together through the mechanism of collaboration. So um, with that, let's pivot and um, Ruben, can you start by just giving, remember we're not, we're not trained scientists, so um, a lay description of the, um, of the project that you all are about to, to kick off. Yeah. Thank you, and, and uh, I promise I'll, I'll keep this brief and so that we have time for questions. Um, you just summed it up perfectly, Anne, about what all of our three bits are. As all three of us have kind of alluded to, the idea of this particular project is that uh, we have discovered a new common, as Zahatam was just saying, a new common denominator, a new biochemical pathway that tumor cells use. So if you have an EGFR mutation, Today, you will get osimertinib, as, uh, as Isabella is getting. Uh, and we know that this gets upregulated in the tumor cells in response to osimertinib itself, in fact. And the hypothesis is, and data we have, is that also for another subset of lung cancer patients with KRAS mutations, there are brand new drugs going into clinical trials here in San Diego and around the country for a specific type of mutation in the KRAS gene called G12C mutations. There are new medicines that will affect that sliver of patients, that 5% of all lung cancer patients. But what we have shown, again, in cells and now in animal models is that those types of drugs also will cause this same response pathway 
this cellular recycling process called autophagy that they will turn it on. And so we have made a medicine against, well, Nick has made a medicine with me. And what we're trying to do with this specific project, which there are no funding mechanisms that like encourage the basic researcher exactly to work with the chemist, to work with the clinician. That's you, each one of us can get funding and we do, that's how we carry the ball, you know, the baton up to the passway point, you know, like in a relay race, I've carried the baton, you know, just barely made it to Nick. Nick's sprinting it down the field and bringing it to Hotem to help bring it to patients. This pedal money will allow us not to simply have to run each part of the relay separately, but will actually deliberately only allow the money for if we actually work together. And so the hope now is that because it is about eight years later, and Nick and I are still perfecting the medicines going in between the biology and the chemistry, but we're finally at a point that we can work directly with uh, Hatim and try to take the first steps towards bringing this towards the patients and then understanding what else do we need to know to, to in this case, quite literally hope that in a few years there will be the beginnings of uh, I ended, you know, basic clinical trials for safety with this compound, with osimertinib itself. Uh, so this is not an abstract removed thing. We are literally hoping to make a new medicine that in the future people might take in combination to prevent, <laughs> to give you more years of bike races across the country, uh, hopefully decades of years, but, but that's what we're trying to do. Awesome. That's Amazing. Thank you very much, Ruben. Um, Nick or Hotham, is there anything that you want to add about the description of your recent project? Or, um, Well, yeah, I can just comment just to uh, add to what Ruben's saying. So we, um, you know, typically you think about uh, universities, SOC, SBP, UCSD as doing basic research. But what we're doing is we have what's called a lead candidate drug which we have uh, designed, literally again, designed it, working with uh, Ruben to, uh, and it, it shows in the laboratory, it's doing exactly what we want it to do. And we're at the point now is we're doing what's called preclinical studies. So we're testing its, uh, as Ruben said, its safety. Um, we've shown that it works extremely well against lung cancer cells. Um, both in the lab and also in uh, mouse models. And um, we're now showing that it's safe so that we can um, move it towards getting it actually into patients in what's called phase one clinical studies. So this is uh, an ongoing, you know, we're, we're really pushing hard on this project. And, you know, it's fantastic to be able to work with her team who is so knowledgeable, again, about uh, the clinical component, in other words, work, daily working with patients like Isabella and understanding, helping to guide uh, Ruben and helping to guide me in terms of what we need to do to, to get a, a, a medicine that really works that you can give to somebody and it will treat their cancer. I mean, thank you, Nick. Yeah, no, thank you, Nick. Actually, and I just want to echo that point is in, in the interest to really come up with new strategies that uh, will um, come to the clinic, you know, the ability to um, participate in a team where even earlier in a drug's um, development to get the, you know, to get the input, of, you know, from patients, from physicians, from um, all involved really helps to even inform some of the preclinical work about what are the right genes, you know, in which to pair a drug with what is the right setting, you know? Um, what is the availability and bioavailability of the drug? Will it be a candidate for progression in the brain versus in uh, the body only? How, how does this relate to other side effects that one specific pill may have? You know, these types of discussions and considerations are ones actually that, you know, we've even across this team have institutionalized in meetings that we have regularly, monthly through a, um, a disease team focus group that we have instituted across uh, 
you know, the Salk, Sanford Burnham and uh, UCSD to really kind of come together to talk about how we can, you know, craft the right um, uh, experiments and also clinical, um, in, you know, clinical translation to, um, to really fit unmet needs. And, and I think that, you know, this is an unmet need with OC Mertinib resistance and EGFR resistance as a whole. And I think it is an unmet need in a larger stance as it pertains to precision oncology, as Nick has mentioned before and Ruben have mentioned with regard to the fact that uh, genomics and medicine has taken on quote unquote a whack-a-mole type of approach where we try to whack genes that just kind of appear or um, you know change through time. But if we truly can find and cripple the fundamental pathways on how cancer survive, then actually you've come up with this, you know, with an approach that can apply for, you know, as Nick has mentioned and, and Ruben has mentioned kind of KRAS as well as EGFR. And we understand actually that some of the downstream pathways, uh, you know, in these cells uh, from the, you know, from those cellular receptors as well as um, activated pathways feed into common denomination, you know, common, you know, common denominator um, uh, pathways. So I think um, our goal and interest truly is to bring this to the clinic. I think the fact that Nick, you know, had, uh, you know, Nick and Ruben have optimized, you know, a target and a, um, a lead candidate. One of our goals will be to how do we actually create this as a clinical trial moving forward, pending, you know, some of the discoveries that are made through this grant. And I think that some of those discoveries are to really improve upon, you know, our definition of um, how well it's, you know, um, targeting the genes, how well it's preventing additional resistance post this, uh, you know, pathway modification. And, um, and really kind of, you know, what are the right uh, commutations and, um, you know, and other factors that seem to um, define its success or not. So I think, just want to iterate that uh, the ability from a clinical standpoint to work with uh, Ruben and Nick to better develop insights into biology truly helps, uh, you know, downstream our ability as physicians to communicate with patients about what on the granular level of a tumor is happening when we prescribe a drug. And I think that, you know, this ability to form a team like this and, um, you know, and have it actuated, have it consistent, have it, you know, in such a way where we're able to, uh, you know, draw on the expertises of a larger group of people, I think um, has uh, helped me to better communicate with patients about what the pros and the cons, the risks and the benefits and the opportunities are going forward. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, in a second, I want to turn it over to Isabella. I'm sure she has a, a bunch of questions, but I just wondered, um, so, you know, we talk a lot about, at Petal about collaboration, and another theme that we hit on a lot is, um, is translation. And so this is exactly what you all are doing, is translating a basic discovery eventually to a clinical setting. Um, I wondered if you can um, comment on um, the cost it takes to translate something, a basic discovery. Um, you mentioned that you're in the you know, preclinical phase right now. Can you talk about how costly it is to develop a drug and get that mass produced and ultimately till it's with patients? Sure. I mean, I can, I can yeah. start. I mean, the reality is that um, at the early, early, very early stages that we typically work out in the, in the lab, it's relatively uh, comparatively inexpensive, okay? But the further you move a drug down the path, the more expensive it becomes. So at this stage, once you start preparing a drug that will go into, into patients to do all the tests and so on, you're up into um, literally a couple of million dollars to get it through to that point where you uh, present all the data to the Food and Drug Administration and they say, yes, you can, you can now take this into phase one clinical studies in patients. 
And then beyond that, it becomes even more expensive. So then you're talking um, tens of millions of dollars to move it through phase one and then phase two, phase three. So again, you're looking at safety of the drug, but also the efficacy. In other words, is it, okay, is, it, does, is it fine to give to patients and does it kill the cancer cells? Yeah. Comments, Ruben or it's no, I, I think Nick, um, Nick summed that out well, especially kind of the stage where this project is at. I would say the other part that relative to what it costs as you start easing into clinical trials, the basic research is less expensive, but, but still does cost. Um, I mean, I would say Nick in my lab, we have been working on this specific project since 2011 or 2012 was the beginning of when we first started screening small molecules against this particular target, trying to someday, if we were fortunate, to get to where we are now. And over those, you know, eight or nine years, each of our labs has spent, you know, somewhere between 300,000 to 500,000, I would guess, between the salaries, the expenses for the chemistry, the expenses for the animal models, all the reagents to do the testing, perfecting, tweaking, diagnosing. Um, Lab research is expensive, and uh, I mean, you can just think about it from a salary perspective. If there are four people who work on the project and you're paying for all of their salaries plus their benefits, that right there uh, gets you easily towards $400,000, um, you know, per year. So to, to even attempt to, um, to, tr to try to do this, not even to succeed, but even to try, uh, is going to take... Um, you know, on the order of probably five million over um, five to eight years before you get to where we are now, where now it's going to take a couple million just in the next six to 12 months. And mm. if it works, then then it's going to start being 10 or 20 million per, per six months. But if you don't do those earlier steps, there is nothing to try. In those first eight years is really when you're weeding through hundreds of things, hoping to select something the very most promising and efficacious before you have to make a $10 million gambit on one, right? Because you, you're not trying, $10 million is for one. You're not trying 10 different analogs of azimertinib and then seeing which one works the best. You've gone all the way through and you've said, this is the best one. Let's like, that would be an interesting story for another time is what is the backstory on that specific drug? Because that is like a second or third generation TKI against EGFR. So there were many, many drugs before osimertinib, which were not as good um, and um, were good, but just not nearly as good and, and didn't last as long at all. They would give durations of three months or, or maybe five months. Uh, so what it takes to then improve and come up with combinations is um, it re research is expensive, but when you think about what the possibilities are, Isabella's story is one that, you know, everyone should hear that that has been possible. So if we had never, if scientists had never invented the technology to identify genes back in the eighties, they would have never found EGFR. If chemists had never come up with ways to drug EGFR in the first place, they could have never derivatized it to make something as excellent is azimertinib, you know, just that. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Isabella would have got her diagnosis. And what happened after that, nothing, none of those other things would have happened. You know, diagnosed in 1990, she would have gone home to her family. Um, it's just, uh, it is a real example of what, how good we've gotten so far, but also what we need to do now. Yep. Thank you so much, Ruben. I think another story we could come back to for another session is um, at what point does pharma come in and, and where are those tens of millions of dollars absorbed and where they come from? That's not our part. Um, we often view ourselves as the seed funders and we want to fund you early stage so those brilliant ideas don't die um, and that you carry them on. And so more to come on that. I, you know, I, I do want to hear um, Isabella, um, do you have questions for the panelists or comments or that um, have come to mind throughout this presentation? Um, I, I just want to make 
a comment about my story and, and all the others. There's so many people like me in this situation. And on my bike ride, which took about six weeks, I tracked um, deaths in my immediate community, EGFR, online, you know, we're connected through Facebook community. There were 20 deaths in that community where the TKIs just stopped and people went from being very active and doing great to dying within a few months. It was stunning to me to see. Um, and it just, again, it puts, in, from my perspective, an urgency to your research. <laughs> um, my, my biggest question is, you know, how quickly <laughs> can we get it into for phase one, you know, and um, it sounds like it'll be a few years, but, but there is an urgency to it. <laughs> Isabella, would you be willing to comment just on your mindset and your attitude and the way that you stay so strong and, and happy and don't let lung cancer get you down? A lot of that's just living in the moment. You know, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow <laughs> and it happens. Um, so who knows what the future will bring? And I have great faith in our esteemed scientists. <laughs> so, um, but it, it, it does take staying in the moment and appreciating that moment and not jumping too much ahead of yourself. Well, thank you. I see a one pretty specific question that's come up and this one is for Hotham. Um, is the selection of second line treatment based on new mutations in the lung cancer or just different TKIs against the original mutation? No, that's a really good question. And I think it, it speaks to, um, you know, some of what we had mentioned before, which is, um, in lung cancer, and especially kind of in this context of EGFR on pill-based TKI therapy, we can see that new genes can pop up. And in fact, actually, while we don't 100% know the exact distribution of the specific genes that do, we know that there can be additional mutations within EGFR. And the strategy that Isabella is, is taking on now kind of and you know addresses that component of um, if there are new mutations in EGFR, then perhaps dual combination of the EGFR inhibitors in some cases can have efficacy. Um, but also there can be new genes. And uh, when there are new genes, um, and actually I have been in this situation a number of times just even this week actually where um, you know some new genes have erupted and we have um, you know, been in positions to be able to combine um, some therapies based on the fact actually that there are some published reports of um, that strategy of combining inhibitors where there are applicable targets that you know that do run, you know that do come up. I think unfortunately, uh, in the context that we can't track a pathway or a gene that comes up, the standard approach is chemotherapy post um, EGFR progression. And I do say that not that chemo doesn't work. And in fact, actually chemo does work in many cases for many patients, but it is a little bit unfortunate because in a way patients have gone from many years on a pill with minimal toxicity in some cases, you know, in many cases, most cases, to now having to consider chemo. And sometimes psychologically that can actually also be, you know, a hard thing, right? Because it involves Firstly, infusions coming into the center, you know, uh, blood work that is more frequent and, um, and things like this. And so I think overall, uh, the strategy of coming up with combinations that can address the specific resistance is a strategy that people have invested in going forward. It's more consistently being shown as an applicable strategy in the context of EGFR. And it is being adopted in some cases for other oncogenes as well. And, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, chemotherapy does have a place in this context, but um, in the effort to try to expand options, you know, some of the options that we uh, are conceptualizing as well as those actually that combine these genes, um, you know, really try to provide additional opportunities outside of chemotherapy. Unfortunately, in the context of EGFR, another major advance in cancer discovery has been in the immune system and uh, immune therapy. But unfortunately, immune therapy has not worked well in the context of EGFR mutation positive patients. 
and also may have some deleterious effects when combined or in proximate use to some of these TKIs, including osimertinib. So we really have to think about cancer as an individualized thing. And I think that is actually moving forward in many contexts where um, we, um, you know, we are really understanding how the genome is changing. We now have FDA approved blood tests that can help mm -hmm. to uh, track cancer. And uh, we are actually, you know, embracing opportunities to, uh, you know, address resistance through targeting those resistance pathways. Thank you very much. Oh, yep. Isabella. I was just going to say the new mutation that was detected was, for me, was detected through a blood test through the circulating DNA. And the idea there is that you catch it before it becomes hard tumor, which is you're ahead of the game. So I actually started this treatment before I actually had tumor in my body, um, which is, I think, a positive step. <laughs> yeah, no, that's truly, um, you know, that's truly also kind of on the cutting edge of, of where we are. And I think, you know, um, like, you know, like, um, you know, where, where you had that done, I mean, we, we have also invested a lot in that type of approach of being able to track cancer through time from blood, because what that does is, um, you know, it facilitates an opportunity to gather more information without having to, quote unquote, poke and prod and kind of get a biopsy. Biopsies are very important. And uh, we know that cancer can change in ways that are not genomic, and, but it at least provides some opportunity to get some information. Having a tissue biopsy, though, is the best way to do that because one can find most of the genes you know, through tissue. So I think a lot of um, great topics being put on the table for, for subsequent conversations. Um, I just want to be respectful of time so we can get you uh, hopping back to the clinic and, and others to the lab and, and where they need to go. But I'm um, just to offer a few takeaways of the conversation that really have me excited about where we are today and going forward. And I think one of them is just the value of the team approach is you all couldn't articulate that more. And that's something that's really exciting for us as an organization and to see you all moving forward. Um, the second thing is just the uniqueness of San Diego. And, and I know, Ruben, you've talked about um, many other places don't collaborate as openly as the way that you all do. So kudos and, and thank you. That's another exciting thing. And I think another thing is just this theme of personalized therapies that target individual mutations. Um, it's exciting going forward. And I think um, this is all so inspirational. And, and Isabella, I mean, you are just, you're why we do this and, and why the physicians and, and researchers on the line um, do this as well. So all of our Padres Pedal uh, participants and donors listening, um, it's your funding that's making this possible. Um, and we heard that it's costly to bring drugs uh, to market and we have a role in that cycle. So uh, we're not going away. We're gonna continue fundraising um, harder and harder. And um, I just need to close by thanking each of you, Isabella, for joining us. We haven't known each other too long, but it's felt like a while. Um, and it's been exceptional to get to know you. And to Ruben and Nick and Hotham, thanks for joining us today and for everything you do. Um, and also uh, just thanks to our, our donors and participants on the line for making this possible and to our corporate sponsors. Um, we have many corporate sponsors who continue to fund our organization, ResMed, Thermo Fisher Scientific, Lasardi, CBRE, you can see them here. And, Without these sponsors, um, our organization wouldn't exist and we wouldn't be able to donate 100% of your fundraising dollars to the mission. So um, I know we're a few minutes late uh, today, but thank you all so much. And um, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you all. all. all right, Stay have a good strong, afternoon. Isabella. Stay Make strong. Guys. I will. <laughs> Keep working. <laughs> you will. You will. You will. Yeah. We'll do our part too. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. And thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.